This is episode 92 of The Variety Artist. This is John Abrams, your host and that guy that interviews successful variety artists from around the world. Here it is, the final interview of the decade. Goodbye 2019, hello 2020. I hope it's been a successful year for you. It certainly has for me. Thanks to you, this podcast has taken off. I've been lucky enough to interview famous entertainers that I only dreamed of meeting years ago. Steve Trash, Leland Faulkner, Barry Friedman, Steve Axtell, Robert Bax, Paul Romani, Niels Dunker, Mark Daniel, Nick Lewin, Bob Fitch, Danny Orleans, Avner the Eccentric, Frank Olivier the Evisons, Peter Samuelson, Claude Haggerty, Peter Irish, and so many more. It's been a great year. If you haven't listened to any of those, go back and listen. These folks have some amazing advice and terrific stories. Well, today is no different. Today's guest has been a hero of mine since I started this entertainment journey some 20 years ago. There's an old saying that says something like, never meet your heroes, you'll be sorely disappointed or something like that. Well, I'm glad I met my guest today. He's a hilarious entertainer and all around great guy. You'll be glad you met him too. Enjoy the final interview of the decade. Fun fact number 811. When John was a senior in high school, he snuck in a flask of whiskey to watch all the final scenes in drama class. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. He's an internationally acclaimed magician, comedian, and motivational speaker with over 40 years of stage experience. Steven has graced the cover of every magic magazine you can imagine. Here are just a few of his career highlights. Chosen to represent the U.S. at the World Summit of Magic, he's been the featured entertainer, magician, comedian, and lecturer at the Blackpool Magic Convention, the largest magic convention in the world. I could go on and on. Oh, did I mention he's also the father of the famous Nate Bargatze? He's one of my heroes in the magic world. Variety artist, I give you Stephen Bargatze. Wow, this puts a lot of pressure on me. It's a lot of pressure on you. I know. It's a lot of pressure on both of us. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, the first time I discovered you was on the cover of Magic Magazine. I think it was November 2002. Does that yeah, sound yeah, right? Yeah, I remember that. I have no idea. But yeah, that, uh, you're about right. The right. The timing is about right, yes. Okay, because I started this in 1998, and I'd be looking through Magic Magazine, which is my favorite magazine, and there you are, right in the cover. All right, perfect. I made it. Uh, now, we're going to go right back to the very, almost to the beginning. Uh, tell us about your bulldog story. Well, I, my, uh, I was a, a little kid. I grew up in a, a alcoholic home. My dad struggled really bad with uh, with alcoholism and but uh, anyway, not that this mattered. We, we were just in a bowling alley, and he put me in the wrong door. He thought I was going in the nursery. He was heading to the bar, and he just shut the door. And, and this door should have been locked, but it's where the guard dog were kept. And uh, I was oh. uh, attacked by a bulldog, and he bit me in my face. And oh. this tore from a little bit above my nose all the way down towards my ear and damaged the muscles to my tongue and stuff like that. So... Some people have probably already noticed that I talk funny uh, because most of uh, my face is in my butt due to plastic surgery. Okay. They fix that, but I have a lisp and uh, water gets in my mouth and, and stuff. So I have to keep swallowing when I'm talking. I started off as a clown and I have a great clown voice for a clown to talk like me. People think it's great. And I'd, I'd meet all these clowns that go, I don't know how you do your voice. And, you know, I'd say, look, you got to get a dog. And uh, getting to bite you, and then you you made it, but uh, none of them was that dedicated. But that's kind of the way I talk. I used to never tell people. You know, I found out when I was doing comedy clubs that people would talk and say, "I wonder if he talks like that on purpose," mm -hmm. or and then does he know he spit on that lady and stuff like that? And I'd go, "Yeah, I always know." So yeah. I just thought that I just made a little, wrote a little comedy about it and talk about it and just get that out of the way. So I don't have to answer those questions and everybody can just get on with the, the show and realize, okay, we just have to listen careful. Right. Now you started off as a clown? 
my mentor was Tom Hart from uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and he was Ronald McDonald. Mm. I saw him perform, and I thought magic was real, and I asked him about it. Wait, wait, are you saying that magic is not real? What are you saying? Well, according to him, you can learn some of this stuff. Okay. <laughs> but he taught me. I just went up and met him and asked him, and, you know, he said, well, you just read books, and he kind of gave me the short answer, and I, he could tell that it hurt, broke, hurt my heart. I was about 17, 18, and then he said, what? I said, I had a difficult time reading, and then he goes, well, let me show He showed me how to back palm a card mm. and told me where he would be the next week and said, you come there. If you can do that, I'll teach you another trick. And so then he became my mentor, and every time he would get dressed as Ronald McDonald, I would get dressed as Yo-Yo the Clown. Huh? The clown got me the courage to get up in front of people, even though I talked funny. Yeah, I probably played a clown for almost uh, eight to ten years wow. when I first started off, just to get the courage to get up and work and, and, and get up in front of people. And But I realized I could be funny, and then... You know, who wants to be a clown the rest of their life? And, and for me, I didn't. And I wanted to get the makeup off and finally just start getting the courage to take it off and become uh, Steve Bargatze. Oh, yeah. I used to do Charlie Chaplin. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's much great. younger. And same type of thing. I, every morning, you know, I get up and put on all the makeup and do the whole thing. And at one point in time, I said, you know, I just need to not put this makeup on every day and perform. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you go, oh, all right. This is not so hard. Yeah. So do you remember that first time that you had no makeup and you were exposed to the audience, your, your real face? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I remember just the, I mean, it's just that fear that, are oh, they going to laugh? Are they going to think, I mean, cause I still, I mean, I'm a pretty outrageous performer sometimes, especially with my looks and my eyes and I do a lot of stuff. So I do some clowning things and, but without the makeup, you, you know, I remember being really, really nervous. Are they going to laugh? Are they going to think I'm an idiot? Mm -hmm. And then I realized, you know what? I want them to think I'm an idiot. I want them to think that I was, they were fooled by an idiot. This guy doesn't know what he's doing, but somehow he's fooling me and he's entertaining me and then, and then we're off. So in a, in a way I'm still a clown. Now, do you have any crazy stories about when you were a clown and maybe some crazy kids? Uh, no, my craziest story is also my son's story. Uh, I was working at Opryland theme park here in Nashville, Tennessee, and my son, Nate, the comedian, fell off a cliff mm. about 30, 40 feet into some water. And some, so they get him, they rescue him, and they take him to the hospital, and they call me. And I get a call out there and saying, your son's in the hospital, you need to go see him. And so I jump in the car and take off to the hospital. My wife is with Nate by now, and I, I actually beat them, the ambulance, to the hospital. I got there first. When they got there, they heard the people say, we're not getting out because there's some crazy clown running out there. And oh, we don't no. Know what the, we don't know what's <laughs> happening. So they kept my wife and them in the car and me in the ambulance. And she finally, she goes, a clown? That's, that's our husband. That's my husband. <laughs> and so, yeah, all right. So then they, they brought Nate in and he was fine. So the first thing he sees when he wakes up is a clown face. <laughs> yeah. His first comedy album was called Yelled At by a Clown. <laughs> Any performers that ever do that or have a dad or a parent that is in is also a performer, it will be well worth your time to look that, uh, listen to that. It's on iTunes. I think you can get it yelled at by a clown. Very funny, just from the aspect of a child with your dad being an entertainer. Yelled at by a clown? Yeah, yeah. It's one of the, I think the greatest title ever. That is great. Of any comedy show could be is yelled at by a clown. And then his second album is called Full Time Magic. Oh. Because he, he says, Danny, he always goes, well, you know, uh, it's cool to have your dad as a clown until you're about 10 or uh, 11 years old. Then your friends start going, is he still doing that? Yeah. And he would always go, no, no, he's almost full time magic now. <laughs> almost. <laughs> so that was the name of his second album, Full Time Magic. <laughs> See, you went through probably the same thing I did. You know, when my kids were really, really young, they, yeah. they were all, oh, my dad's a magician. Isn't that great? Isn't that cool? And then they became teenagers. Yes. And it became really not cool to become a magician or to be yeah. a magician. And then once they were 18, 19, 20, then all of a sudden it was cool again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think we all, we all must go down that road. And now that we're doing comedy clubs and stuff like that, my daughter and uh, other son, they always say, yeah, I want to bring people and they come see you. 
I, I went through all of that. Now you have yeah. three kids. I have three. I have Nate, mm -hmm. and then I have Derek, Abigail. Derek is a missionary in Uganda, mm. and he his wife is a midwife, and they're here now doing some schooling and stuff like that. Works for Global Outreach Development and very great actor, but also a very funny kid. I mean, mm. all my kids are funny. Abigail is a nurse at the Veterans uh, Hospital here in Nashville and mm. also somebody that's very funny. Yeah, I can't, I can't imagine why. Her son is named Caleb Glenn. He's opened up for Nathan and he's opened up for me before in the comedy club, 12 mm. years old. He writes his own jokes. Uh, we just did a show like two weeks ago. He wrote so many jokes and he had them, but the joke, his la the joke before his last joke killed. And it was, I mean, really strong laugh. Yeah. He went, all right, folks, thank you very much. I'm out uh, here. And he had another joke in his pocket, but he was smart enough. Oh, at 12, yeah. I wish I was that smart. Yeah. A lot of us don't learn that lesson until later. <laughs> when you kill you walk off that's right and he was i'm out of here so yeah. we were we were more proud of that than anything else yeah he knew when to walk off that's great <laughs> now your son's in uganda i gotta tell you i was looking at my stats the other day and i had one listen from uganda so maybe it'll be two oh, yeah, now yeah 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 that's right that'd be awesome so do you have some philosophies on comedy other than walking off when you kill uh, you know, my, I think the, uh, is listen to your audience. I can't tell you how many things are in my show. It's just something funny that happened one time. Comedy and everything is all about stage time, how much time you put into it. I mean, how many times are you in front of people? And funny things happen. And when they happen, then our job is to make it happen every night. Mm -hmm. and how can I make that bit, little bit happen? One of the tricks I do, Dick Stoner came up with the idea. It's, it's uh, a fishing net, and you have about 32-inch sponge balls. So it's sponge rabbits, but it's done with – I do clown noses. Uh, I put one in the net, and I tell a person, I say, tell everybody what that is. So it's just a little orange sponge ball. One night, this girl walked over and stuck her head in the net. Mm -hmm. and she said, it's an orange ball. And I go, you know, hey, what grade are you in? I'm a uh, – senior in high school and I go wow and you had to walk over there and look inside you know most people would have stood right over here and just looked through the sides <laughs> so that moment is a very funny moment yeah. and so then I thought I had to think how can I make this happen every night how do I get them to go look in the net yeah and it's very simple I push them I just basically put my hand on their back and just with my middle finger I push and I'd say 98, 99% of the people would just naturally go over there and look in the net. And they don't think about it. And they don't think that you pushed them or anything like that. They're very embarrassed once I say, well, you know, what grade are you in? Most, I know. Yeah, and if yeah. they're older adults, I say, you know, where are you from? You know, I'm from Ohio. We're in Tennessee. We just look through the side of the net. <laughs> it's just taking moments like that. Oh, Yeah. And uh, making it happen every night. How can, how can we do that? And make it look organic and make it look like right. it's the first time that it's ever happened. There, this is a pet peeve of mine because you say that. But I think one of the worst things that comedians do that I see do bad is when – because it's I, – I, my, one of my mentor, the guys I really mentor, one of the guys I loved was Red Skeleton. Mm -hmm. And the thing about Red that I liked so much was that he, could, he would get – look like he got tickled at his own joke. Oh, he would. He would. He would giggle. He would giggle under his breath. Yeah. Oh, it was so it was so endearing and so great. So I've always wanted to do that. But I've seen so many guys do it badly yeah. where they look like something funny's happened and they put their hand on their side and, and shake their stomach and stuff. Or they just do something. You just go, you, you know, you just you're just doing this. You got to. So I really practice and study on how can I make it look like that I'm tickled. So I, I do a trick where I put two plungers on somebody's head yeah. and they're attached with a telephone wire. And I, I intentionally get a guy that has no hair. So the plunger will get stuck. And so quickly, I mean, I just got I just bow my head real quick when it happened. Like, <laughs> like, Oh my God, I touch my face and just kind of cover my mouth. Like I'm trying to hide and I'm smiling. <laughs> wait, 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 and, before you go on, do, do you look in the audience beforehand, before you get your volunteer uh, and you, you try to pick out a bald guy? 
I don't try. I do pick out a bald guy. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I find the perfect person, and I, find, I I know the exact perfect head and what's going to work and what won't, and I can make it stick. In most of my corporate work, I get hired for. The, uh, I got people that hire me for this for the plunger thing. If I and if I took it out on my show, they'd be mad and they're going, "Oh, we want." And so when I get there, they go, "We got here so and so. We want you to put a plunger on his head, and we want you to do that." Now, if I can, I like to go do a trick for them, do a joke or two to see if they can take it. Yeah. I don't tell them, look, I'm going to bring you up and put a plunger on your head. But I, I want to I wanna test the waters to make sure he's a good guy. And if yeah. he is, then he's in. That's all I need. And I even do that when I work for Nathan in the big theaters. Uh, nobody really knows exactly who, what his dad looks like and stuff like that. And he's selling out these theaters. Yeah. So I walk around. And I ask people, uh, how'd you guys, I just look like I worked there. I mean, I'm just a guy. And I go, hey, I, who found Nate first and uh, who brought who? And But I'm meeting my people to see, because I got too much writing on this for me to get somebody that's not going to be good. That's yeah. not going to have a good personality. That's not going to be able to kid around and laugh and things like that. So I, I want to know all that before I put that plunger we've all picked a bad volunteer accidentally and, oh, and there's yeah. nothing, there's nothing that stops the show faster. Oh no, no, heck no. And another thing, you know, I'm putting a plunger on this guy's head, but just so that your audience knows at the end, he's a hero. He reads somebody's mind and nobody knows how he does it. Nobody. Mm -hmm. So he has that gift that he can do with it, whatever he wants. If he wants to go tell him how it's done, he can do that. I don't tell him not to, but I don't tell him to. I do say, look, you got the secret. It's up to you. You keep it. Nobody will ever know. And as far as I know, I hope most of them will just keep it because, you know, they look pretty cool. We all had laughs on their behalf, but they walked off people going, I don't know how you did that. How did you know what that guy was thinking? That So it's still comes out good at the end. But my point in all of this was, I can't tell you how many people come up to me and go, I was at the show when that plunger got stuck on that guy's head. Mm -hmm. You got to remember that because you started laughing and it really, so I, I know that I must be doing it right because they think that that is just what you said a second ago. Yeah. It's something that's happening for the first time. They yeah. think that's what they're seeing. Yeah. That you accidentally picked a guy with no hair. Right. He just happened to come up. Yeah, yeah, just luck of the draw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the big one of the other big lessons there is that I, I've, I've watched a lot of your videos and throughout the show, you know, you're having fun with people and, and being silly and goofy and stuff. But every single person that walks off the stage is the hero of the trick. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you saw that and noticed that. Yeah. Because that's really important to me. Now, I grew up, I like Amazing Jonathan, and I, I mean, he, oh, yeah. he's my kind of humor and stuff. But I've, all, I've seen people run off the stage with him. They don't ever want to come back but because he, he really uh, was abusive in his early years with the one guy. But it was funny, and he could, he could get the most out of them way better than I could. But I also I wanted to always make sure that I leave and that they realize that, man, you know, I was part of the show. I was on there. And at the end of my real show, I, I bring every person. I don't bring them up, but I bring them back their names or whatever I can to say, look, without them, there wouldn't have been a show tonight. Let's make sure that we thank all these guys for volunteering because they really don't volunteer. You just go get them. Well, yeah. No, that's a great idea. That's something that, that I think a lot of people can emulate. I don't know. Are we stealing if we emulate that? No, heck no. You know, people get so wrapped up in your comedy, they don't realize that your magical chops are great. Was it 2000, 1999? You won first yeah. place at the IBM close-up uh, competition? Uh, the IBM is just, it's a great organization. And for people that are not magicians, what does the IBM stand for? The International Brotherhood of Magicians. Okay. There's two major clubs, and the, there's the IBM and the SAM, the Society of American Magicians. Both of these are good. You just got to find the one that's in, in your area. For me, we have a local magic club. Ronald McDonald, the guy who helped me, he was a member, and he got me to remember. It's where I found myself. Because mm. you see all kinds of magic and people practicing, and they help you, and you see what you like. You know, you see guys, there's guys that did birds and doves, and we had guys that did illusions and stuff like that. And then you had cards, and you got to go, wow, I really like this. I like that. Uh, this, And you just, 
end up going to the people that you really like. That this is the stuff. I knew I always wanted to make people laugh. So I, always, if you were funny, I didn't care what you were doing. Doesn't have to be. I know that, but comedy is just what I've always been drawn towards. Yeah, that's your style. That's my style too. Yeah, I know you can't tell on this podcast, but no, 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 no. That's all right. I'm sure I'm not very funny right now either. <laughs> If I just told people what I did, yeah, you put plungers on people's heads, he does this, and he, it doesn't yeah. sound very funny to me. I don't know. Plungers on heads. So there's something about that that's kind of funny, especially in a bald guy. Funny story about that. I did it when I was young. I used to put it on somebody's head, and, and at the end, I, I would make it stick and just unscrew the handle. Mm-hmm. And then I would go, let me ask you a personal question. You're not Jewish, are you? Because uh. we can just leave this on. And uh, as a joke, ha, ha, ha. And then I would just shake the guy's hand and let him go sit down. Because it looks like he's wearing a yarmulke with the yarmulke on? Yeah, yeah. And so he'd go sit down. Well, I was doing a show. At, it was at Opryland Hotel. And this guy was great, funny guy. He left it on. Not only did he leave it on, he left it sucked on. Oh. And that's like the second, third trick in my act. And I'd had an hour, you know, almost an hour of material later. He comes up at the end and says, you want your plunges back? And I see that it's stuck. <laughs> he never released it. And when I took it off, his head was solid black. Oh, it was like, oh, and I was young. I just went, oh, thank you. Shook his head and he would, he couldn't tell. I could tell. And I just went, but later on he found me and he sent me a really nice picture of him and the plungers and me that was in my bathroom for a long time. My <laughs> wife made me finally took it down, but uh, and he sent me like updates on his head on how long it took. And it was almost three months before that was gone. That wow. Was gone. So now I do not do that. I release the pressure as soon as I, uh, we do that a couple of times. I don't, I'm smart enough not to leave it on there. He was good natured, but there may be some people that aren't so good. Yeah, yeah, about that's it. right. That's right. This guy was, yeah, I could have been in court. He could have owned a hotel or something. The Sam convention that's coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm, I'm going to be mm-hmm. interviewing um, Dal Sanders, but I noticed okay. that you're speaking at the Sam convention, right? I, I'm, I'm uh, going to roast Mac King. Oh. I feel in for Mac uh, in Las Vegas at the Harris Hotel. Mm-hmm. He, I've been doing that for about 10 years or so, and it, not because of Mac, but because of his wife, Jen. She saw me perform, uh-huh. and she told Mac, you know, you need to get this guy. He would work. And then luckily for me, when I've gone out there, it's always gone well. Uh, I know for a fact that they've never had anybody ask for the money back or anything like that when I perform. You got just a short time it's because about 80% of the crowd – are finding out for the first time, right when they introduce you, that Mac's not there. <laughs> you know, it's like, what? Oh, so they're you know? expecting, ladies and gentlemen, Mac King. Yeah, and they go, and if Mac does it for you, it's great. He says, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be with you, but I got a good friend of mine, Steve Burger. So he does it. But still, they're all looking at the gates, because uh, especially the ones that got in free, they might have got caught by the hotel. Mm-hmm. They're going, I don't want to waste a half an hour, or, you know, an hour on this guy if he's no good. So yeah. you just got a short time. Right in the beginning, you got to make them like you Mm. so that they stay. Oh, yeah. The sad thing is, Mike King is very famous with magicians. Yes, he is. But still, about 60, 70% of the audience, I could say, I'm Mike King, and they wouldn't know. And they go, okay, you look different than the poster. (laughs) But those 30% may be yelling something. (laughs) Yeah, the rest of them, okay, whatever you say. Mm. And speaking of the magic clubs, I don't even know if you know this, John, but I'm also the vice president elect for the International Brotherhood of Magicians. Thanks to Mike Finney and Simone, they have nominated me. So this July in Pittsburgh, I will become the international president of the IBM. I did I not know no that. idea what that involves. And there's uh, everybody out there hearing this is probably way more qualified than I am do this i'm not sure about that <laughs> so we have michael finney right now who's the president no he is out he just went out oh he just went out okay alex Zadar. oh that's right hey, alex is in there doing great and then i will be next unless they impeach me you never know that could happen <laughs> yeah with all the impeachment trials yeah 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 you know it's catching on <laughs> yeah that's what i hear <laughs> but after you is ken scott right yeah i hope so and I interviewed him like three or four weeks ago. He has a yeah. terrific interview. I don't know if you've listened to that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I did listen to it. It was fantastic. Oh, it's excellent. I was looking on your website and I noticed a bunch of pictures from Kuwait and Iraq and some different military yeah. 
post? What, yeah. What's that all about? This is a, another guy, John, you need to talk to. His name is Jason Michaels. Okay. Jason is the w- one guy mainly responsible for getting magic and backing with troops and stuff. There's a couple of people doing it now, but I know they they had stopped all magic for a long time, and Jason talked them into taking the show, and me and him went to Iraq and Kuwait and all this stuff to go, and they really liked it. So now they're they're pro magic again, and he's opened. Up, Jason's opened a lot of doors. Jason is an unbelievable guy, and you really need to. I have to give you this information afterwards, but he uh, has stress syndrome. But when he performs, it's very that it shows up very little. So he he just got involved and asked me to do it. He's a fantastic magician. He was the original director for talent at the House of Cards here in Nashville. And okay. He knows all the in and out about those shows. Now, I've been on about four tours, and the longest one being 22 days, and the shortest one was, I think, seven. Wow. It costs a lot of money to move you around and to do all that. And you're in helicopters and plane, you're in all this stuff. They're not going to say, you can't go, hey, I got a weekend. I want to come do this. We're spending money and sending you over there. How do you actually get there? I have a friend who, who did some, he's a musician and he did some yeah. military shows and they actually flew him onto a, um, what do you call the giant ships? Oh, an aircraft carrier? Yeah, they actually flew him onto an aircraft carrier. Wow, he uh, that that is something that I wanted to do, and we had that scheduled, and didn't, and something the ship got called in the Middle East. I just flew on Amer- Delta over to Dubai, and then oh. once we got in Dubai, then we were on military flights from there on. In, in the Middle East, you can only the military can only fly at night. Mm. You're flying in Black Hawk helicopter. You're doing two shows a night, and when you get done with one, you literally run out into a Black Hawk helicopter, and it took us to the next show, dropped us off. They're all waiting for you. Jason would go on first while I'm setting my little stuff up, and then uh, I would perform. And the first time I went, they lost my bags. I didn't get it back for three and a half months. So I learned you don't pack all the one-of-a-kind things, items that you have in your life in there. Yeah. I didn't think I was ever going to get it back. Then I also learned I can be funny without my props. I only had one bag, and it had one trick, that, you know, a couple of tricks I did, but it didn't have the main ones that I thought that I had to do. So I had to just go to the PX and buy some cards and just came up with a show. And, and you know, and you go back to what you said about being a clown, and I found out. You know, it was very good for me to see. I didn't even have to have those props. Even the things I think I have to have now, I don't. People mm. like you as an entertainer, they like you, and they like to listen. And, and That's awesome. You can buy plungers at a PX. So I got some plungers, and I just got some <laughs> stuff and just put some things together, and we had a great time. I think that story resonates with a lot of us because uh, um, I, I have a good friend. His name is Jeff Abbott. He just told me the story this, uh, the other day. He was at, at a magic showcase. He just showed up to drop off some flyers and the person in charge says, oh, okay, you know what? Since you're here, why don't you go ahead and go on? You can go on and take five <laughs> minutes. And so he runs over to the snack bar and grabs a couple of muffins and, and this yeah. and that. And, and he did five minutes. He did yeah. his thing and he was great and he booked a ton of shows. Yes, yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's what you got to do. Yeah. I, a couple of the Middle East stories. What you do is in the morning, you fly at night, like I said. So you, mm-hmm. when you're done, you might arrive back at 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning. You arrive at your next base, and you just go to bed. And then you, when you wake up at lunchtime, you go meet the people that are working on that base. And they show you what they do and everything like that. And then you try to, you try to tell them, talk them into coming to the show. And this is how I got started. Nate, my son, was going way before we were going. Mm-hmm. And he's the one that kind of got us the right person to talk to. He was going, you know, magic is so much better because when I go meet these guys in the morning to say, come see us, I just got to go, yeah, I'm a comedian. I tell jokes. You need to come here. And, but you don't do jokes. You just got to hope they know you or want to come where yeah. we can do magic. You know, hey, take our card. And, and I, we went to a bomb squad. And these guys showed us, they want to always show you what they do first. And so he had this little bomb machine that opened up a backpack. And then they were showing Jason the bomb suit and how heavy it weighs. And he was trying to, he was in it trying to stand up. 
Well, I just talked to the bomb guy and I go, if I put some cards on the table, can you pick in that machine, go pick one up? He goes, yeah, yeah. I said, well, make sure you pick the third one from the right. So then I had a guy think of a card. And once I knew the one he was thinking of, I made sure it was third from the right. And I go, why do I need to find it? Let's get that bomb machine over here to do it. And Mm. he came over and picked the card and they went crazy. (laughs) And uh, even Jason went crazy because no one saw me talk to this guy. You know, so that was a $750,000 trick. But I wish I had it in my act now. <laughs> that should go on your website. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I got pictures. I don't know why we didn't film it. I wish I would have filmed it. Yeah, the, the picture should read, yeah, $750,000 trick. That's great. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Eat your heart out, Copperfield. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to fact or something John just made up. Sound like fun? All right. Is it fact? Ooh. Or is it something John just made up? Ah. I'm going to give you a headline and you're going to tell me whether it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little more about it. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Steven once let his son warm up for him knowing he'd bomb. You're merely making me answer this. This is true. (laughs) This is true. And I wish it wasn't. My son, we're just getting started. And he, he was he was funny. So he was in town and I had a Christmas party at the Opryland Hotel on Saturday night and I couldn't some there was something to do with weather. I didn't make the show. So I missed the show. I couldn't get the plane. I couldn't get back in time. Mm-hmm. And so the guy called I mean he said, Well, you know what? Tomorrow we have a luncheon on Sunday. Come to the luncheon. I go to the luncheon. I I find he tells me they're gonna be eating in the beginning. But then they ought to be done in about 20 minutes. And then you can, I mean, just start while they're eating. We all know that's a disaster. Yep. You don't want to start while they're eating. So I called my son, offered him $500, which for then was a lot of money to him. And I said, you just got to warm up for about 15 minutes. Can you do 15 minutes? And he goes, yeah, yeah. I, I said, well, they're going to be eating. Is that okay? He goes, yeah, it's okay because he has no idea. Wait, how old is he at the time? Yeah, he's probably 24, 5. Okay. Something like 6. He's enough to know, but he's not enough to do. He didn't do corporate. He was just doing, you know, he's doing comedy clubs, and of course they're eating, but it's not the same. Yeah. This is completely different. Yeah. So he goes up there. I felt like uh, Abraham sacrificing his son, you know, sending him up and just going yeah. like, that. you're not going to make this. This is not going to go good. And it didn't. I mean, he was he was dying, and nobody's oh, no. paying attention. Everybody's feeding their plate. Nobody listened. He finally found one little table that was doing it, and he was smart enough to just perform for that table. But when he came off, he was sweating bullets, <laughs> and then I go up, and I kill because now they're done. Of course. Yeah, and I got everybody's attention and stuff, so he, he learned a good lesson. I knew that he was going to die. It was well worth the 500 bucks I had to pay, and uh, he's never li- let me live that down. <laughs> Does he bring it up at Thanksgiving now? Yes, I, yeah. hear, we, I hear that story quite often. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's funny. All right, next one. An audience member actually had a heart attack during Stephen's straight jacket escape of death. Wow, wow. Not true. I had the guy pee his pants. Oh, did you? <laughs> Do you know uh, from Atlanta? Uh, <laughs> Wait a minute. He's uh, Phil Necro. He was a he was he's a good friend of Ken. He's a knuckleball pitcher. Okay. Oh yeah 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 yeah. I do. Pro and everything. Yeah yeah. Phil peed his pants. Wet his whole pants. It was just obvious to everybody. He had just let go. He was laughing so hard. And I've <laughs> I've had about ten people on stage in my life pee their pants. Just just getting tickled where they can't stop. <laughs> I've had kids do that. I don't know if I've ever had an adult actually pee yeah. their pants on stage. Right. You got to work with those ones that drink a little too much. (laughs) Maybe that's it. But I've never had a heart attack. No, no. All right. All right. Last one. Steven has a tattoo of a frog on his right shoulder. Yeah. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? It's, it's, it's not just true. It's, it's not just a frog either. It's Michigan, Michigan, J frog, the Warner brother frog. Oh, the, the one, the hello, my baby. Hello, my darling. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause I, as a kid, that was me. I, I was really, I'm not the life of the party. I, I'm really a quiet guy. 
my wife is way funnier than me. I used to go to her work party. She used to work at a bank and I would go there at her party and just sit in the corner and not talk to anybody. And I just watch people. My wife is t- talking. Everybody loves her. And she's so funny. She's got crowds of people around her telling her, listening to her stories. And then they would uh, say, who's that guy in the corner? And they go, that's Carol's husband. Oh, what does he do? He's a comedian. They go, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh wasn't he funny sitting there in the corner? <laughs> but if you ask me to take over, I could take over the whole party. Of course. You know, you can go, all right. But if I, you know, I'm, I'm just was always quiet. And if you remember the cartoon, he finds that frog that never would perform for people. But that's right. Know, when he was alone, it would go, well, I was, I'm the opposite. I, I was, I'm the quiet guy. But then you put me on stage and I was, hello, my, I could do it. So that was <laughs> something I always wanted to do. But I was smart enough because I had kids to go, I'm not putting a tattoo on me because then they will. And I waited till I turned 50. To get the tattoo, and yeah. I got it, and the next day my daughter went and got two of them, two different of tattoos. Because it's so I it went. I should have waited another ten years, but uh, I do have Michigan J Frog. It's just a nice little reminder to me that show business is show business. Just, we're still in it. That was back Ooh. or something. John just made up. Ah. Right, we're going to go on to some fan questions. You want some fan questions? Why, sure. I'm just surprised as a fan. Yeah, well, you know, every every time I interview somebody new, I put on my Facebook group, the Variety Arts Community Facebook group, uh, that you can ask questions of, ask me at, to ask questions of my guests. And here we go. All right. Mark Wurst, who is a good friend of mine and a terrific magician out of New, Jer- New Jersey, said, he said what a lot of people said. Instead of asking a question, he says, Stephen is amazing. We met him after his performance at a local convention last month. He hung out with us for about 40 minutes, showing us tricks and slights and just being a super generous guy. <laughs> that was his question. Uh, what a good question. You know what? <laughs> that's what we're in this business for. I mean, that's how I learned. That's how we all learn. It's just I can remember... Again, not being that really bold guy when growing up in magic, I was the guy that would sit back and just stare at these professionals. What happened to me was my mentor told me I had to join, get in a contest Mm -hmm. because he said, you can charge more money if you say you're a contest winner. So I got in the World of Wizard contest, a local contest they had here. I did not know that you could just say you're an award-winning magician, like so many people do, that you can just make that up. But I thought you had to really win awards. Two things happened. One, I met people that like what I like. People would come up to me and go, wow, I like comedy. I like to do with this. And then do you ever thought? So that's how I met Mike King. He was a judge. Hmm. So I just started meeting the right kind of people and then people seeing me. And from there, I started getting hired at conventions. But I always knew how hard it was to become one of those guys. Yeah. Like to be able to just go and talk to Johnny Thompson or something like that yeah. without them seeing you perform. So I don't ever want to be that guy. I want to make sure if I see somebody staring from the back or, you know, just at a convention, I want them to come on in, sit down and, if they want to show me something, I'd be more than glad to talk about what they're doing or whatever. Now, uh, you realize after you said that, every magic convention from here on out, anybody listening to this, they're going to come up and say, hey, I was sitting in the corner looking at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. And I would be gl- glad to have them. Oh, that's nice. Glad to talk to them. All right. Doug Shear of Sheer Genius, he actually had a question. He says, let's talk about your I hate kids trick. It's brilliant in your hands. Brilliant because it's personality based and you pull it off hysterically after you've established a strong relationship with your audience. Do you think there's a danger in releasing an effect like that to the magic community in the hands of a weak performer? It could backfire and make the performer look not so nice. Doug, that's an awesome question. Sean Fonkward is a guy that helped me with Palmer Magic, and that's where you can buy some of my stuff from. And he's the one to put that out. I didn't. I just did what I do. I didn't really think about it. He is 100% right. When I first start selling that trick, I couldn't sell it Mm because so many people would go, it is so character-based and saying, I can't ever be mean to kids. I could never do that. I could never say that. And they're right. Nor can they. They shouldn't. But the pros were all buying it because they could go, wow, 
I know how to turn this in. And for people that don't know, there's three wallets. I tell a kid, he can't win. I'm smarter than him. Yeah. What grade are you in? Fifth grade. I had two years in the fifth grade. I way more fifth grade than you ever had. You're not smart enough to beat me. And then he wins the dollar. He finds the wallet that has it in it. And then I wait till he leaves and I show the other ones have a, a 10 and a 20 in it. Mm-hmm. I came up with that as a trick I did in the corporate world, only if they had kids show up, because that would happen more than you would realize the boss or the secretary bought their kids. Yeah. And nobody wants them there. They're mad that they didn't invite their kids. So they kind of like it. And then they see you being mean to this kid and they go, oh, then they're really glad that he won. And then when you show the other ones, they're back to remembering why I didn't get to bring my kids. So they, they like it again. Yeah. Levent does it very well. If I thought about it, I should have put their routines on there. They gave me permission afterward, but I, I should have asked before. And Sean Fonkwar has a great routine with it. Now, every, anybody that knows Sean, he can't be me. Mm-hmm. To watch him do it, you go, well, I could do that. And when Sean sell, he sold eight wallets to every one I've sold. Because they see Sean do it, everybody goes, I can do that. That way, I'll buy it. Oh, I see. And so, But I have learned now, I talk about Sean's routine, and I talk about Levent. Levent, just real quick, his whole idea is not like my thing is, you can't beat me. I'm smarter than you. Levent is, boys always lose. Hmm. I want to help you, but you're not going to win. Boys can never win. And then when the kid, they think he wins. You know, he shows the, he, he puts a hundred in the last wallet he, mm-hmm. and he goes, well, see, I told you boys always lose. Uh-huh. And it's kind of way, it's not near as harsh and it's just fun. But Doug, you're, Doug, you're so right that there are so many people that, and I, t- I did explain that as best I could on the video. Please come up with your own routines and stuff like that. I just, I should have shown them and talked about it more. And so that is the trick you're interested in. Make sure you look up other people doing it. And it's got to fit your personality. It's, it's yeah, one yeah. of those tricks that has to fit your personality, or you at least need to twist it to, to, right. to fit your personality. Yeah, yeah. I, I know how far to take a kid. I'm not going to ever take a kid too far. I'm not going to be that abusive with it because we know. But what Doug is saying is some people don't know that line. They can't tell when the kid, and yeah, you can make a kid cry. You got to be careful. That's another way to stop your show. Yes, it will. <laughs> oh, <laughs> now you boy. have to give him the $10. Okay, here you go. Here's give him the, the 10, hundred. Take the 20. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to get paid for this. All right, do you have some advice for the beginner, somebody just starting out here? Yeah, you know what? Uh, as a, a variety of artist, and, I, and this is just as an artist in general, stuff. We, we, I just think the thing is, it's got to be what you want to do. This has got to be something that, even though it's scary sometimes to get in front of people, it's what you love. And when you, and if you love it, then in the beginning, you have to dedicate your whole life to what you're going to do. Don't jump into this. If you got a whole family and a bunch of kids and you're married and you got a girlfriend and a wife, I'm just telling you, it's a whole lot harder. Yeah. You know, I got into it when I was young enough that I had time to put into it. My son will tell you, these are steps I have to make and I have to get to a certain point. And now that he's resourced everything he's done, he, he, he's now that him and his wife are having children and they have a little girl and then that she becomes a part of their life. But in the beginning, he was married to becoming a comedian. Oh, yeah. He was making his craft as good as you can. So it's, you know, I don't know how to say that. I'm not saying that family's not first. What you're saying is absolutely true because at the very, very beginning, even myself, 24 7, you're thinking about yeah. how to put your show together, uh, whether to do multiple shows, how to market it, doing all of these things. And there's really no time for a family. I mean, that's the right. truth of the matter. Right. You are married to your craft. Right. And you don't want a job that's going to take all your time or your weekend time or anything that's going to keep you from being able to do this. Uh, so let's say, if this is my goal, then I don't want to work weekends. I got to mm-hmm. have a job or whatever I'm doing. I got to pay my bills while I'm learning and trying to get shows. But I have to be able to have the time off to do the shows and the, where the shows are and to get out there and do it because it's all about time. Ten years and I know that sounds like a long, long time. We know that it's not. Yeah. You should have your down pat to be able to start your family and go do whatever you need to do. Right. And, and once you put in that work, it's much easier yes. once you've been doing it for 20 years to, to put together a new show or put together a right. new routine. 
Right. And right. I will say this, that I think this is above all for beginners for me, is find your character, find out who you are. Because if you don't know who you are, you, you're, you're chasing too many things. You're going after this trick, that trick. I'm now. I'm, I'm going to learn to juggle. I'm going to learn how to play the guitar. I'm going to learn how to, you know, do a vent. I'm going to add all of this stuff. And but who are you? Do you have some advice for the working pro? So so good. My advice is to realize that we're not in this. Uh, we're not all fighting each other. And I know sometimes that happens in a small community. You think, oh, well, he's my competition or she's my competition. I don't want, don't do this. I'm doing that. And we're not to worry about the other guys in our business. We just worry about what we do and we do it very well. So if I'm competing with the guy in my magic club or the guy else who I beat and we, we juggle together or whatever it is, he's not my competition. Mm. My competition is myself and just making my show better. We in Southern California, I am, I belong to the Kid Dabra, Kid Abra oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, group in Southern California and we support each other and we refer each other business. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's great. All right. How about a recommended book? Uh, you know what? Uh, st- for me, finding that character part where first one I read was uh, Ortiz, uh, Strong Magic. Oh, uh, it was really good about that. But then the Ken Weber, Maximum uh entertainment both of his volumes were very very good he has a great insight uh, what i like about ken's is he uses people that you know like he talks about my king and then what makes my king so strong and everything like that in the second book he talks about me and my son so i have oh. to like that <laughs> you have no choice you gotta like that one yeah yeah <laughs> you know but read other books i loved harry potter and uh lord of the rings those little books that i read when i was first starting that really made me enjoy this magical world that we're a part of all right with that i'll let you go here that was so fun thanks Stephen, for doing my show that was that was really cool do you have some social media or anything you'd like to promote yeah, you know, where can they get your products and all you know what i'm old so come on uh my website is magic of steven with a ph okay dot com and whatever i have there is whatever my manager puts on there or something like that i don't i'm not a tweeter uh, or an Instagram guy. I'm not going to do that stuff. My magic is sold by Palmer Magic, Sean Fockworth's site, Palmer, P A L M A R M E R, Magic out of Canada. And mm-hmm. uh, he has anything that I we put out by me, we'll always go through Sean. And somebody's asking, about, like, what's your Facebook handle? I have no idea. It's my name. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but right now, you know, I've got a lot of people. I have to get rid of people to get new people, but okay. I've got people I can get rid of. Don't worry. I just kind of, but I also on that Facebook stuff, I have kids. I, I mean, I was the kind when Facebook started, you took everybody as a friend, you know, if they had a bunny rabbit in the picture. Yeah. Okay. You're a friend. I have kids on there. So I don't, you know, if you're going to use foul language and all that stuff, I mean, I don't want you on my Facebook page. Too many people are seeing it that probably shouldn't be seeing that. So I do go through it weekly and delete all those people so i'll make room for you if you're a good guy if you're a good person yeah yeah there's no need and that's what you know and this that's go back to my son i, I didn't need to promote him nate bargetti his comp his netflix special is called the tennessee kid mm-hmm. he's going to do another netflix this april uh he'll be in uh if you look under nate bargetti's comedy.com you can find what cities he's in i'm going to be doing i like surprise visits i've done 10 10 of them this year and I'm probably going to do another 10 in the city. You know, maybe it'd be the one that you're at. But I like, I go and get to open for him. Wait, so has he ever, has he ever put you on thinking, my dad's going to bomb on this one? No, he hasn't. He, <laughs> he, the funny thing is he doesn't like following me because I am so outrageous. And he's kind of, uh, his pace and timing is like, he has my timing, but he, he's not wild and loud and all that kind of stuff so you have to really he's a very smart comedian i've watched some of his videos he's kind of a calm storm yes yes yeah. but i'm telling you people laugh from the beginning to the end they never stop so but he he's learned how to bring me on it's really funny and uh he, he's learned how to follow me i tell stories about him about he's not as funny as everybody thinks and then he tells people stories about it about me uh, when he first comes out and he goes, yeah, this is my ha- house. I do Joe Givens gumball machine. Oh yeah. He just, he, he just, it's, it's a joy to watch people love on your kid because it's, it's an it's outreach of who you are too. 
All right. I'll let you go on that. <laughs> thanks, John. All right. And thanks to all my variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, spread the word. You can reach me from my Facebook page. Just shoot me out a message and make sure to take a look at the previous interviews. That list is a who's who of variety artists. Download and listen to any one you want. Thanks again, Stephen, for taking some time. This is awesome. Thank you, man. All right. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist, but your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist, but until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. <laughs>